Welcome to what I think is going to be a very informative uh, and interesting uh, evening. And I am especially delighted, and I want to get the pronunciation right, that we have the ambassador from Finland, and that is Mikola Hotala. Hotala. Yes. All right. <laughs> Finnish names are hot. And then we have the first secretary from the embassy, Maria Kogel. So what we'll do this evening is uh, I'm going to chat uh, with the ambassador and Maria for a while, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. But the reason I asked the ambassador to join us in Vermont today, and we were down at Harwood Union High School uh, in the afternoon, is I think it's terribly important uh, for people in our state and in the country to understand that what goes on in the United States is very different than what goes on in terms of social programming in countries around the world. And I think our corporate media and our political system do not do a particularly good job of educating Americans about options that are open to us that already exist in countries around the world. The ambassador was telling me before, and I took it as a compliment, that my views, which in this country are, you know, I'm, I'm part of the extreme left, in Finland would be what, mainstream? I, w I said boring mainstream. Boring mainstream. <laughs> I took that as a great compliment. Uh, and it's true. I mean, the ideas that many of us have been fighting for are ideas that have existed, not just in Finland, but Scandinavia, other countries, uh, for decades. But for a variety of reasons, uh, they're not even discussed here in the United States. So when they are discussed, they're seen as extremely radical, pie-in-the-sky utopian uh, ideas. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, please sit down. Maria, please sit down. Uh, let's begin. Um, For the last five years, uh, Finland has been uh, has been called the happiest country on earth. There are doing, you know, there are organizations that do intensive polling around the world, and they ask people how they feel about their lives, and they compile the information. And for the last five years, Finland has been literally on top. Uh, over the years, other Scandinavian countries, Nordic countries, have also done very well. So my first question. Uh, for the ambassador is why do you think uh, Finland ranks uh, top in the world in terms of human happiness? Uh, thank you, Senator, and, and first of all, thanks for the invitation. And, and it's great to be here. It's my second time in Vermont. I'm, I'm really happy and excited to have spent. Very here. happy. See, this uh, is what yeah. happy people are yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Ecstatic. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, when I tell people uh, that uh, Finland continues to be the happiest nation on earth, usually people get a critical look and take a look at me and they say, I mean, you don't look so happy. You, <laughs> you look actually pretty serious. Right? <laughs> then I always say, that's because I'm seriously happy. <laughs> but on, on a more sort of, a, sort of a substantial note, I would say that the the key reason for our happiness is definitely not the climate. It's not the 800-mile uh, common border with Russia. Uh, it's, it's not the, you don't have, it's not the 2.5 million saunas in our country. It's not the fact that we drink more coffee than any other nation in the world. Uh, this might, might contribute a bit. Uh, I, I don't exclude that uh, totally. But I think the main reason for our continued situation is that uh, uh, Finnish people do have a very high degree of trust in the institutions and in each other. Uh, so I think for most of the people uh, in Finland, uh, life is, and I stress the word, relatively kind of stress-free. Because uh, you don't really have, I mean, I don't think of my health care issues ever in Finland. Because uh, there's no real reason to do so. 
because if I get sick, I, I know I will get the treatment, and I, I know that uh, my life, uh, I mean, my, my life be, will be, might be in danger, but still I know that I get the treatment and, and my family will, uh, will, be, will be okay even after that. So uh, also studying um, education, uh, we know that uh, regardless of the origins, uh, we get a good education. It's also regardless of where do we live. Uh, I'm the ambassador here, uh, this is my second ambassadorial posting. Uh, Maria is, 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 uh, is, uh, is here. We are actually from the same town. And actually our parents were in the exactly similar uh, blue color professions. So it, 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 it's kind of a, of course, she's a bit younger than I am. So, uh, but uh, but it, it tells you that uh, I think we are, our life is stable and, and in that sense stress-free. It's not problem-free. We all have problems. We all have uh, the same kind of issues and challenges. Uh, but still, um, I think that's the reason that people are not perhaps ecstatic, like you said, but they are fairly content and, and they can trust and, and they can plan their lives knowing that certain key parameters of your life will, uh, will be protected. I think that's the reason. All right, what I want to do now is just go over various aspects uh, of Finnish life. Uh, and I think the American people would be really shocked, and, and, you know, and that's why we do these things, to hear what goes on in, in Finland. So I want to start off with, all right, you got a young couple, they're pregnant, uh, I want to ask, Maria has a one-year-old baby, yes? So yes. this is for her, not an abstract idea. Here, grab the mic there. Uh, what kind of benefits, Maria, were you able to, you know, other Swedish, other Swedish, Finnish uh, families able to benefit from during pregnancy? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Senator. So at the moment, I'm a working mom, but um, before um, I, I returned to work, uh, I spent six months at home with the baby, and then afterwards, my husband uh, spent another six months with the baby. And you may ask, like, how is this possible, like, financially? So in Finland, the system is that for, for the first three months um, um, after your baby is born, uh, you basically get your full salary. And then afterwards, for the rest of the, like until up to one year, um, and nowadays actually even a bit longer, I think it's like 14 months, like the system just recently changed. So I, 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 I unfortunately was not able to enjoy the new system, but I, even the old one is pretty good. So um, up to one year, uh, you got um, around like 60% of your normal salary, which is a sort of like a parental allowance that is paid by the state. So it's not your full salary, but you, uh, it's still pretty good, I would say. You survive. All right, so let's recapitulate here. You have, when you give birth, three months full pay. Yes. And then you have the rest of the year at about 60% pay. Around that, yeah. Okay. Number. Now, in this country right now, we have no pay family and medical leave it, it, from the federal government. There are thousands and thousands of women, lower income women, who give birth and are forced to go back to work a week or two after they give birth, all right? Which to my mind is barbaric, uh, as a matter of fact. All right, that's a contrast. All right, let's go to the next step. You have in the United States and Finland, you're working, and in this country about 80% uh, of households are two, are two uh, breadwinners in each household. So mom and dad are both working. Here in Vermont, which is about the national average, costs 15,000 bucks to uh, have uh, decent uh, childcare for your kids, $15,000, that's average. Maria has her kid in Washington, D.C., which is very expensive. How much does it cost you in Washington? So in, in D.C., the prices, they tend to vary between 30, up to $35,000 per year which is, well, a huge sum so of money. So in various, in Washington may be as high as any place in the country, up to $35,000. Nationally in the country, 15000 Just think, you're an average family, you're making sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year, single mom making $40,000 a year, how do you possibly afford 15000 Now there are programs that will help lower income people, to be sure. But childcare is 
a very expensive proposition if you can find quality child care. There's a slot available for you. People have to wait for a long time to get decent child care. All right, tell us about uh, child care in, um, in Finland. So in Finland, um, the, most of the child care like, centers are municipal. We have some private options available as well, but like most kids go to, go to um, municipal um, uh, child care. And the cost of the child care is um, based on your income. So the minimum that you spend is like $30 per month, and the maximum is up to like $300 a month. All right, so you're talking about maximum. Yes, maximum for upper, for income, people. upper income people, yes. 3600 a year compared to on average $15,000 a year. All right, now it turns out, and we can take some questions on it later, it's a very interesting issue. Finland is often also ranked in terms of its educational system as number one in the world, and it's a very different system. It's unlike the Chinese or in Singapore where they really put a lot of pressure on the kids. Their approach is very different. Um, but before we go there, I want to talk about higher education. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, okay, everybody, you know, we send our kids to college. Uh, we got uh, 45 million Americans dealing with student debt. Talk about the cost of higher college and graduate school uh, in Finland. Well, it's pretty short story. There is no, there are no fees. So no, no fees for tuition, uh, so it, it's, it's free. Uh, you have to pass the exam, which is based on your skills, your abilities. If you pass it, then it's, it's free. You have to pay, uh, like in Helsinki University, you have to pay, I think, $200 uh, as, as, as a payment for membership of the student association, which then gives you the access to the student medical care, which has a, a separate uh, medical station and medical uh, care. So uh, it's, uh, I think the obligatory fee is $200 a year. All right, so in our country, where so many people are struggling, A, with student debt, would be even questioning whether they want to go to college and come out with that huge debt, what they have decided that in a competitive global economy, it makes sense for all the kids who are able and want to get a higher education be able to do so tuition free. Um, they also uh, are strong in technical education. Can you say a word about that? Yeah, well, of course. I mean, uh, we all do realize that the uh, modern economy also needs working hands with skills. So that's why we put a lot of emphasis on uh, vocational training. So it's actually uh, one of the basic roots of school. So um, when you are 16, you can actually choose a vocational school, uh, which takes two, three years. But I think for us, the ma main point is that you need to have a good basic level of education. Why? Because the demands of the work life uh, uh, economy will change. So you have to be able to retrain for different professions during your work life uh, time. So we try to give everybody a good basic level education then they can choose more academic kind of a path or vocational training. Uh, it depends on what they want to do, and, and, but it's, it's all, I mean, in vocational training, you get the same, uh, same benefits. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not separate uh, in terms of uh, uh, how you are being treated. It's the same, same system. All right. Um, I want to skip to an issue dear to my heart, and that is the healthcare issue. Uh, as I think all of you know, uh, we spend about, if you can believe this, it's really quite incredible. Anybody have any idea here how much we spend per person on health care? What's the guess? What's the guess? Per person, for every man, woman, and child in America, what's the guess? What's the time frame, in a year? Right now. In a year. In a year, yeah. $120,000? No. No. I mean, anyone have a guess? No? Yeah. How much? No. All right, the answer is $12,000 per person, per person. So think about it. If you're a family of four in America, you are spending $48,000. There are many families that don't make $48,000. Obviously, as you know, we have a very complicated system. We have Medicaid, 
We got Medicare, we have the Veterans Administration, you got Obama, Obamacare, and most people get their care through their jobs, okay? So it's a complicated system, but at the end of the day, we spend more than twice as much per capita as they spend in Finland or in Canada, and yet somehow they manage to provide quality. The care in your country is pretty high, yes? Yeah, well, that's All right, one of the highest quality care systems in the world for half the price. And it's a much simpler, less bureaucratic, less aggravating system than we have. But, all right, so tell us, Mr. Ambassador, somebody becomes ill, they end up in the hospital for two weeks. What's the story there in terms of drugs and health care costs? What do they end up paying? I hope the story ends positively, but uh, in terms of economy, um, it's also pretty simple because uh, you have to pay as, as your contribution a small fraction of the real, real cost, which means that uh, usually after a couple of weeks in hospital, we are talking about a few hundreds of dollars, uh, not thousands. Uh. Oh, you got that? You're in the hospital for two weeks. Anybody been in the hospital in Vermont or any place else in America for two weeks? What's the bill? Tens, could be tens and tens of thousands of dollars. One million. One million. Pardon me? One million. One million. Yeah, I, I, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine in the Senate told me that her niece had a back operation. It wasn't even a life-saving operation. It was serious. Not life-saving. It's about a million dollars. All right. Now, she didn't have to pay the million, because, you know, but we got something like 500,000 people in this country go bankrupt because of medically related bills. So I want you all to think about it. Somebody has cancer, they have some terrible disease, they're struggling with this disease, and then when they get out of the hospital, they gotta figure out how they can pay some huge amount of money if they don't have good insurance, and then their credit is destroyed, they gotta declare bankruptcy. So you go bankrupt because you were sick. Does anything that make any sense to anybody? I mean, it is a horror show. All right. Uh, the system is very different in Finland, uh, and I think they do uh, the right thing. Um, I want to ask the ambassador a few more questions, and then we can uh, open. Well, let me the obvious question. Some of you may be thinking, well, hey, free health care, that's good. Uh, free education, that's good. Uh, how much am I paying in taxes? Do I have anything left uh, after I get paid? What is the tax system in, in and how much do people pay for these services? Well, tax system is progressive, so it depends on your uh, earned income. Uh, the more you earn, the more you pay. Uh, personally, uh, I don't know what Maria pays or anyone else pays. There's a, it's private information, but uh, I'm open for transparency. So my tax rate is, and I'm a high-income person by Finnish standards, uh, my tax rate is 33% uh, of the income. Then I have a, a, a so-called kind of a maximum rate. Uh, so if I earn more than this maximum rate, which is a six-figure number, then uh, they take 51% out of that amount of money, which exceeds that selling, uh, selling uh, sum of money. So, but basically, during a normal year, uh, unless I work uh, uh, through the nights, uh, extra hours, uh, so uh, my tax rate is 33. Okay, so, you know, it's high. It's high. But, you know, I don't know how much higher it is than in the United States. And what they get for that is they don't have to pay private health insurance. They don't have to pay for the kinds of costs that we have in terms of childcare. They don't have to worry about how are they gonna send their kids to college among many uh, other things. All right, I, here's an interesting issue. I have been long concerned about how corporate media functions in this country uh, and the kind of built-in conflict of interest between billionaires who own the media and what media reports. Uh, and in Finland, interestingly enough, they're tackling that problem, and, and I want the ambassador to speak to it, but as many of you know, in the United States, and, and here in Burlington even, you know, it used to be the free press, or whatever you might say about it, uh, they were a major paper. They are now a, a, a skeleton compared to what they used to be. 
Uh, and what's happened is Gannett and all these other big change have downsized. They can't make enough money now in papers because of the internet, okay? So you have many hundreds of communities all over America who have no daily newspapers at all. It's a very serious problem. Talk a little bit about how the public, how Finland handles media uh, other than just private media. What, what do you guys do there? Well, first of all, we have uh, freedom of expression. Uh, it's a constitutional right. So we share the same principles of uh, free and open media. Most of the media is, is private, it's commercial. But then we also have, I would call it, uh, in front of this audience, a Finnish BBC, if you know the British model. So we have publicly funded uh, a national broadcasting company. Uh, I think the, they, of course, they are not partisan. They are not allowed to be. They, it, it would be illegal to kind of uh, uh, be partisan. There's also a, a committee in the parliament which kind of watches over that it doesn't turn against some, somebody uh, uh, according to some partisan lines. So I think the benefit of that company, in my view, is that uh, actually it, it can offer people more variety in terms of programs, because not all the programs or shows that they, they, they transmit, they don't have to be equally profitable. Uh, so they can actually provide better service uh, for the public. Of course, it's uh, you always, um, there has to be a balance, and of course, uh, the private media, commercial media, is really important, and that's the most, the biggest chunk of the Finnish media market is, is private. Then I will just add um, on, on how to deal with the information. We have uh, focused quite a lot uh, already for a couple of years, and even longer, uh, how to teach our kids so-called media literacy. So they can actually understand how the, media, how, media, how the media works, how the news are being made, what are the criteria, uh, and they are also trained to see and understand different agendas so that they are critical towards whatever media they use, whatever news they get, so that they, they understand uh, this aspect. Of course, the idea is to give them uh, a so-called vaccination against uh, propaganda, disinformation, so that they can critically treat the information uh, wherever they get it from. Okay. Um, right now, obviously, we've got elections here in, in three weeks, so it's very much on my mind. Uh, in this country, we have a um, campaign finance system that allows all of you billionaires to spend as much money as you want uh, on the candidates you want to win or going after the candidates you want to defeat. Uh, we have a two-party system, uh, basically. Um, tell us a little bit about the Finnish uh, political in, uh, system and campaign finance and so forth. Well, the political system is uh, we are a parliamentary democracy. Uh, so the president, we have a president too. Uh, he mainly focuses on foreign policy and, and uh, defense issues. So he doesn't have so extensive a mandate across the board of, of national policies like in the US. So the main sort of uh, governing body is the government, and, and uh, they always have to have a majority in the parliament. So parliament is the real source of also the government uh, power. So all the laws obviously have to be passed with a majority. Uh, in our case, we have nine parties in the parliament, uh, and uh, uh, basically, I mean, I might get in trouble in the Finnish media if I say so, but uh, basically all of them, and I, I don't name them, all of them except for one perhaps might qualify as, as, as some fraction of the US Democratic Party. Uh, one of them, I guess, uh, could be considered, according to US uh, kind of a political style, they could perhaps be Republicans. Uh, so that's the system. So we have a mo lot of parties. They are competing for power. There's no single party that can ever dominate the system. Because even the biggest party, they typically get 20% plus. So it means that they have to negotiate. They always have to find partners, the other parties, and they have to form the government so that they can together amass 
sufficient number of votes in the parliament, which has 200 seats. So uh, I think the culture in our case is that uh, you have to negotiate, you have to govern together, and also because you know that you might end up in the government with that party. You may even dislike that party, but since you have to be ready to govern together, I think it kind of moderates uh, a bit the way uh, how policies are being conducted and how the politics is being made. So that's the system. Elections uh, we have every four years, you have every other year, uh, so um, it's, it's, it's every four years when the whole parliament is, is being uh, elected. Uh, obviously there are rules how to finance uh, the, the, the parties, how to finance the candidates. Uh, I think uh, I'm not going to give any political assessment on the US elections or US uh, political system as an ambassador. I'm not uh, allowed to even do that, but uh, I just say that in our case it is different uh, and I think we are really critical uh, towards the role of these financial contributions to campaigns. So we have limitations, we, there's a lot of public scrutiny over that financing. So uh, if a millionaire liked a certain candidate, could that very wealthy person put unlimited amounts of money into a campaign? No, it, it can't be really un unlimited. So it, 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 it would be, and basically I also think that uh, uh, politically, let's put it this way, if I would be a candidate and I would find uh, a nice millionaire who would like to totally finance my campaign, like give millions or hundreds of thousands, uh, that would politically be a kiss of death for me. Huh. It's kind of a, because the, it would be known and um, I, I think my political career would be over before it started. See, in the United States, that's how we begin our I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have to tell anybody in this room that uh, climate change uh, is an incredible threat uh, to the planet. Uh, and in my view, at least, uh, we need to very rapidly move away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Uh, what is Finland doing with regard to uh, climate? Well, we have, I think, the most ambitious climate policy within Europe. Our goal is to become climate uh, carbon neutral by 2035, which is really uh, an ambitious target. We are making good progress. Uh, in our case, uh, we are producing uh, already more energy from renewable sources than from fossil fuels. Of course, it's a difficult, cho difficult task in Finland because, because of the climate. We have to heat our homes and actually that takes a lot of energy. Uh, then as, as a kind of a counterbalance, we are lucky to have more forests than any other nation in Europe. 76% of the forest. And of course, as you know, forests are also carbon sinks. So it, it kind of compensates our emissions. So uh, that's why we do believe, and actually we now have basically 50% more of a forest or, or trees in our forests than we had 50 years ago. So uh, by having a sustainable forest management uh, techniques, we've been able to grow the, the wood mass uh, in, that's growing in the forest, which means that, uh, uh, frankly, we can also, uh, we can compensate the emissions that we have. Uh, right now we are heavily trying to kind of increase the number of electric cars. And I, I think in our case, um, they, they, these are greener cars because uh, we have a lot of nuclear power in Finland. It's, uh, 36, 38 percent, depending on the uh, on the day that we get from the nuclear, which is emission free. Uh, so we are uh, moving uh, steadily uh, along that path. I think now the and by the way, coal is going to be illegal in Finland in 2029. So uh, so many many municipalities that use use coal, they are already uh, getting rid of that replacing it that with something else. And then we have wind. Uh, wind power is increasing fast. We are really putting a lot of new capacity. And uh, wind power construction in Finland is commercially viable. So they don't get any subsidies at all. So they, they, it, it has to be self-financing self, uh, and self, it, it has to be commercially. Uh, and actually that, at the moment it's the cheapest 
way of getting new energy. The problem with the wind, of course, in our case, is that since it doesn't wind always, so the energy grid gets unstable unless you have nuclear and some other sources. In Finland also, I just want to add, I know that Vermont is, is a slightly atypical case in the US because you have a lot of uh, uh, energy produced uh, from wood materials uh, like sawdust residue that you get from the uh, forestry industry. That's the same case for Finland. So we get a lot of biofuels from our forests. But still I want to say that we use biofuels sustainably, which means that, uh, like I said, we try to make sure that we have sufficient uh, numbers of, of forests all the, all the time growing so that we, we don't end up in a situation in which many European countries ended up already hundreds of years ago. They don't have any forests left because they, they, they cut all the trees. So we can't afford that. We have to maintain uh, our forests. Okay, uh, the last question I wanted to raise is, is that uh, uh, Finland has an 800 mile border with Russia. So obviously what's going on in Ukraine and Russia's aggressiveness is of concern to the Finnish people. Uh, the uh, ambassador uh, before he came to the United States was the Finnish ambassador to Moscow. So he knows a little bit about Russia. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about your assessment of the Ukrainian situation? Well, uh, my first kind of uh, takeaway from that situation is that it's going to last a long time. Uh, why? I think the key reason is that uh, for President Putin, Ukraine is actually the only item on his political agenda right now. He doesn't seem to have any other meaningful policies. It's, it, everything is about Ukraine. He has an idea that, uh, which comes from the Russian imperial past, that for some mystical reasons they have a right to govern another country, another people. They, he even denies the existence of Ukrainian people. <coughs> so uh, I think it's uh, when you have this kind of a really deep ideological grounds for the conflict, uh, and you have a population which is largely accepting <coughs> this uh, aggression, I think it's going to be the long-term thing. For the Ukrainians, uh, I think it's easy for us to understand because we've been uh, having a number of wars in the past with the Russians. Ukrainians are fighting for their own homeland. They absolutely have nowhere to go if they lose it. It's very hard uh, sometimes for Americans to understand what it means when your own home territory is under threat. Because you guys, don't, you don't have to worry about the Canadians coming across the border uh, like, like uh, I don't think nobody loses sleep over that, at least a healthy person. So uh, I, I, I think uh, that's the major difference. And uh, like the senator said, um, I know that you are admiring the, the social and healthcare systems in the Nordic countries, but I just want to add that uh, it's, it's really, for us, it doesn't work without the military security because we are living in a rough neighborhood. That's the reason why we are, uh, we actually make all the NATO numbers we spend heavily uh, on the military, not because we want to spend, but simply because we have to spend in order to stay safe, to build a kind of society that the Finns want to build. Uh, a reason why we are also seeking membership with NATO is that uh, we want to make sure that we are not alone. And I think we believe that by joining NATO, we can increase not only our own safety and security, but also the security of the alliance. And, and uh, not many people know that, but we really do take defense seriously. And just to give you one example, all the men are obliged to serve. All the men go to the army, uh, usually after high school. I did serve, and I can tell you a story. When I was, uh, I actually moved back from Moscow, end of July 2020. I took my family, I have two small kids, we drove from Moscow to Helsinki. I, I, I parked the car in the middle of the night. My wife took my kids inside. I said to her, that I, I'll go to check the mailbox. The first piece of paper I took out of the mailbox was a military order for me to report for duty 4th of September that year. The second piece of paper I took out, I had been away for a couple of months, was the, the, the letter from the mobilization office that why haven't you confirmed your attendance in the, in the reserve training. 
Then the next day I, I wrote to the mobilization office that, hey, uh, I'm supposed to be the new Finnish ambassador to the US 1st of September. So it's kind of hard for me to, <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the pandemic, to fly back and forth to be training with you 4th of September. So could I get accepted? And I, I, I included in the mail uh, my military staff in Moscow. I was still technically the ambassador of Finland to Moscow. And, and then I waited that this will do the trick. Uh, next day comes a reply uh, from the mobilization office saying that, how can you documentally prove that you are a new ambassador to the US? <laughs> <laughs> then I, I started to think that, I mean, just how many fake ambassadors <laughs> are there trying to get exempted? <laughs> but basically, I, I got exempted, uh, and, and this time, next time, you, you, you are not. Uh, so uh, this is the... But there's a reason. It's not that we are militaristic or anything like that, but we simply have to make sure that we can build our society uh, free of outside aggression and, and, and influence. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's open it up for uh, questions. Um, how are we doing this, uh, Katie? Just... All right. Raise your hand and Haley will find you. Haley, why don't we do something unusual? Start from the back and come on up. We'll get to you guys. Yeah. Keep the questions brief if you can. Um, I have a, an offering, uh, like your comment on this. Um, people say, oh, well, the reason why you do so well in your country is because it's so small. And I thought, you know, if I, I look on the map and I see the size of Finland, can I go to through the United States map, find a comparable size state and say, hey, why can't we adopt national, uh, 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 you know, healthcare system and daycare and so forth there. And then it'll be, then you've got one state and then we can point, say, hey, it worked over here right. and then spread it. Right. No, I think that's an excellent uh, point. You know, sometimes people say, well, they got five and a half million. We have 330 million. Why are you comparing it's apples to oranges? But you're quite right. Many of our programs are developed and shaped by states themselves. So we've got states who have the same size as Finland. We're smaller. Can we learn something and adopt those ideas? Absolutely. I mean, that they spend less than half as much as we do on healthcare. Is that something that we can learn from? I think so. Okay, good point. Okay, let's go to the back, Haley, and move it on up. Yeah. Sure, okay. Question, yeah. By the time you got there, people drop their hands, all right. Thank you so much for your time, first of all, but... Um, Hold the right mic a little bit closer to you, Mike. Jumping right into climate, um, knowing that Finland has taken such aggressive, aggressive action as of late, and that Biden did recently pass our own climate bill, I was wondering if we had any more um, legislation coming through, because the aggression that we took was not as strict as what Finland did, knowing that the U.S. is a much larger country and has many more companies and things like that. So what's the plan? Uh, in my view, you know, people get upset and they see what happened this last summer. Uh, we see the heat waves in Europe, uh, in China. We see the drought in the west coast of this country. We've seen thousand-year storms, five of them, uh, this summer alone in the United States. And you know what? If we do not act boldly and aggressively, it's only going to get worse. Because, oh, you know, we used to think, oh, there was a terrible storm. Probably won't see that for a few more years. Wrong. Everything being equal, you'll see more of it with more intensity. So it is my view that this is a crisis situation. We have to act almost in a warlike manner, go to war against climate. What complicates the issue is that this is a global problem. China is a bigger emitter of carbon than we are. And one of the many disturbing aspects of the war in Ukraine is that Russia now is isolated, and Russia is going to have to play a role uh, in transforming our energy system. So to answer your question, we made a start by putting a lot of money into sustainable energy, into uh, electric uh, vehicles, and so forth. But we've got a long, long way to go. Uh, 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, you rely about 35 or so percent of your energy on nuclear power, uh, which makes some of us kind of cringe. Um, but I wanted to uh, ask about the standards of disposal from the nuclear power sure. and how you run uh, those power plants because, um, you know, we, uh, most of us here remember Chernobyl and then like earthquake in Japan, what it did to the nuclear power plant there. Great question. Mr. Besser? Yes, so uh, we, like I said, we use a lot of nuclear. I think it's, uh, to be honest, it's the only choice we have because uh, in our case, we don't have so much hydro as the Swedes and Norwegians. Why? Because it's a flat land, mostly. So there are not, no, no, no rivers of that size, and of that uh, sort of uh, magnitude. So we have to cover that with nuclear. The other choice would be some fossil fuels with emissions. So that's the reason why we have to have, to have it. Then how to dispose of that nuclear waste? We have now opened, um, I would say, I'm of course uh, trying to put Finland in the best possible light, but I think I'm, I'm correct here. We have developed uh, a so-called, it doesn't tell you much, but it, uh, it, the name is Onkalo. It's a, it's a really uh, deep uh, 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 sort of tunnel in the deep rock, and there's no seismic activity. Basically, Finland is, is, is sort of uh, free of seismic activity. So the risks of anything leaking out, out of that uh, deep channel is, uh, is, is, is totally theoretical. And it's, it's totally much better than how do you deal with the waste uh, in most places, where the waste can be even sort of waiting outside, waiting to get, get treatment and so on. So I think uh, uh, for us the clear point is that we need to have uh, as credible as science and, and any, any practical consideration can give uh, a, a, a solution for the how to, where to maintain, where to keep this, uh, that waste. But as I said, our conclusion is you cannot have a strong economy, strong industry without sufficient level of base energy. And, and, and for us, since it doesn't always wind and we cannot fill the whole country with the, the, those windmills, then you have to have that source. And that's the, that's the only alter alternative, actually. Okay, uh, Heli? Yeah. Yes, I'd like to understand a little more about your tax system, as in uh, like corporate tax rates. Uh, how do you tax corporations if you do? Um, what's the maximum personal tax rate? You graciously shared your 33%. Um, and are citizens filing tax returns and getting big tax breaks or dodging taxes in some other way? Because that's, you know, we, we all know in America that our, our very rich don't pay their share. How do you solve that problem? Well, um, I think uh, in order to really fully respond to your good question, I think uh, I would uh, need to find a, a tax accountant or consultant in Finland. Of course, you have all these details. I think uh, if you go into the really high income brackets, then the tax rate, I think these days, if you really earn in, in several hundreds of, t of thousands or millions, then the tax rate is, is somewhere, I mean, roughly half, or even, even sometimes beyond. Historically speaking, this is not uh, much. In many of the European countries, you even had higher tax rates. And I think in the US also in history, tax rates have, oh, been, yeah. have been much, uh, much higher. So I think it, it goes uh, uh, to like 50%. So, but I, I can't, I've never, I mean, if I sometimes it, will earn those incomes, I, I will tell you, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's not. What about not, not, corporate taxes? Corporate trade, I think now it's like 28 or, huh? Yeah, I think it is, it is close to, close to 30, yeah. Yeah, that's the corporate trade. Thanks for your time. So the Finnish ambassador mentioned how most people in Finland have a very deep-seated trust in the institutions of government. Here in the United States, I must say the culture is not necessarily that uniform. So my question to the senator is, how do we change the culture here in America to have a more deep-seated trust in American government institutions in order to enact sort of these programs that we all want to achieve? Well. The American people are mistrustful of their government for good reason. Uh, and just think about it for a moment. 
the two last wars that we were engaged in, uh, in uh, Iraq and in Vietnam, were based on lies. And God knows how many, well, in Vietnam we lost 59,000, in Iraq and Afghanistan, fewer, but they were based on, on lies. Um, you have a political system, as I mentioned earlier, which nobody denies. I mean, right now, I follow this thing very obviously closely. You have billionaires spending huge amounts of money on campaigns right now uh, who elect people who will do their bidding. So you have, uh, you know, you all know my politics, and uh, I'm not here to tell you that the Democrats do a particularly good job. They don't. Uh, it's a lot better in my view than the Republicans do. But I'm not going to tell you. If you're an average person in this country, do you know that you, in real inflation-adjusted dollars, you're earning less than somebody 50 years ago? Did you know that? Anyone know that? In other words, can you think, when I was mayor here in Burlington, when I took office, we didn't have a computer in the building. We didn't have one printer. Think about how the world has changed since the early 1980s so that all of us are far more productive than we used to be. And people are earning less in real inflation-adjusted dollars than they did 50 years ago. So if you're that worker there, or you're that worker who has seen his or her job go to China or to Mexico, if you're one of the 60% of Americans today who are living paycheck to paycheck, while three people own more wealth than the bottom half of America, do you think you're gonna faith the government gives a damn about you? You don't. And you know what? You're right. All right? It's a corrupt political system, and it's a rigged economic system. That's what it is. Rich get richer, working people struggle. Billionaires buy and sell politicians. So why should anybody have faith in that system? And I think people have become so demoralized and this is what has happened historically, is they look to a strong person. They look to somebody who says, I know what the problem is in your country. It's immigrants, it's black people, it's gay people. It's Muslims, you name the person. And you just divide up the population and you come into power. That is what we're struggling with right this very minute. I'm gonna be running all over the country next week trying to deal with this issue, all right, to try to save American democracy. So the demoralization is very deep. It has a lot to do with people who are living in despair, are going nowhere in a hurry, and they don't quite know why. They're working hard, and their kids are in worse shape economically than they are. They can't retire with dignity. Half the people, elderly people in this country, have income of 25,000 or less. Most older workers have nothing in the bank. So how would you feel about how the government is working for you? Not very well. So, you know, you know, you're looking at somebody who works with other people, trying to build a movement which brings people together around an agenda that works for all. And the good news is that most Americans would be supportive of a system like Finland for healthcare. Most Americans think that public education, or at least community colleges, should be tuition free. Most Americans think billionaires should stop paying their fair share of taxes. Most Americans know that our child care system is dysfunctional. More and more Americans understand that we've got to be bold about climate change. Most Americans know that women have a right to control their own bodies, et cetera, et cetera. So on all of those issues, there is a coming together. But then you have to ask yourself why we don't even talk about those issues. Do you hear anybody other than me talking about income and wealth inequality? Why not? Do you think it's a good political issue? Because politicians don't want to antagonize the billionaires who contribute to their parties. Do you know how much they're spending in this election? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. That's where the ads are coming on television. Where do you think that money comes from? I know where it comes from. All right, it comes from the wealthiest people in this country. So it takes a whole lot of work and that's what we're trying to do now. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you that it's easy, and I'm not going to tell you this country is not in very difficult straits. But thanks for the question. And back, back to the structure of your social life in Finland, I'm wondering if um, that style 
is diminishing criminality, mental health, addiction by allowing people to live that way or homeless? Good. Is, it, is there a diminishing in all these issues that we have because of our lifestyle? Uh, Madam, I'd like to, I'd love to say to you that uh, my country is a paradise. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it's not. So we also have all those trouble, all those problems. I think with the mental issues, uh, I think we are not, we are somewhere in the average of the, like we used to call them OECD countries, the Western developed uh, industrialized countries. Uh, I think uh, I, I don't have comparative figures with the US, so it's very hard for me to say where we, where we stand uh, with the US figures. Um, on the drug use, uh, that's, all, that's, that's a problem, uh, definitely. Uh, again, uh, no comparative figures. Homelessness, I think here I can add some elements. Uh, we used to have that problem fairly serious in the south of Finland, uh, uh, still in the 80s. Uh, now we have been able to reduce that, I would say, by 75%. So we are down to uh, like uh, roughly four or 5,000 uh, people uh, uh, which are homeless. Uh, I think the key to that progress was the understanding that our social services made in the 90s. They did understand that uh, uh, apartment or a place to live cannot be a kind of a reward for a person who can prove that they can work, they can, they can hold a job, they can kind of live more or less stable life. Because the problem is that uh, if they don't have a place to live, you can't fix all those other problems. So you have to start from giving them a place to live, then you can actually, from that starting point, you can actually start fixing all the other problems like addictions, etc., health problems and, and, and economic problems. So uh, I think that's been one of the great successes we've had on the homelessness front. But that has required uh, um, lots of learning and also lots of uh, uh, work from our social services. But, um, but it's, it's, been, it's been a success. Mr. Sanders, um, as a young person uh, in our society, seeing all of the flaws in all of America, what can I do as a young person? What can we all do besides voting? Thank you. Well, I, I think, look, here is just a few basic principles that I operate under, which I think are true. Number one, real change, structural changes in society never take place from the top on down. Okay, it's not like somebody signs a bill in Washington. When that person, saw president signs a bill, it's because millions of people down below have demanded that bill, okay? Uh, and I would give you, we talked a little bit about climate. You know who has led the effort in this country and around the world in raising consciousness and making demands on government with regard to climate? it has been young people, for the right reason. You wanna be living in a planet that is healthy and habitable, have children that can grow up in that planet. Young people, you know, you could argue very definitely that the bill that we passed, which went nowhere far enough, would not have happened without the mobilization of millions of young people in this country uh, and around the world. Uh, second of all, uh, what the system doesn't tell you is that you're very powerful, all right? Uh, the ambassador we were talking earlier, what percentage of, uh, uh, Finland is, is union, unionized, would you guess? Uh, well, I think it's uh, roughly 80% or right. so. Uh, 80%. <laughs> and it is not an accident that a country which has 80% public and private unions has the kind of policies they have. There has been a concerted effort for decades now on the part of corporate America and their right-wing allies to break unions, to make it harder for workers to organize unions. Right now, right now, literally, I'm, I just signed a letter yesterday demanding that Starbucks start negotiating 
and, 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 and a, a contract with the you know, thousands of workers who voted to organize, but they're, they're gonna resist it. Um, so there is power in organizing and bringing people together. You with me? So, you know, if you want universities to de-invest from fossil fuel, you have the power to do that. If you think that healthcare is a human right, you have the power. And it is more than just voting. Voting is very important. But it is not just voting. It is running for office yourself. I know, you know, one of the things that the progressive movement has been successful about right now, I'm going to be in Texas, I don't know, next week, with a guy who in his early 30s, uh, Greg Kazar, out in Austin, Texas, uh, and, and who has been an organizer, ran for office, and is now going to be a United States congressman. All right, and we are seeing young people all over this country running for school board. You could do it. Running for city council, you could do it. Running for state legislature, getting the experience, running you know, for Congress, running for president, you know, do whatever you want. But getting involved, and, and the main thing is, I know a lot of your friends think you know, the politics is bullshit. Why do you want to get involved? Why do you come to a meeting like this? And you've got to tell them, you really do, that if they're worried about student debt, if they're worried about climate, they're worried about women's rights or gay rights, you know what? If you're not involved in politics, you're not really addressing those issues in one way or another. You, your imagination is as good as mine in what you can do. But bringing people together, mobilizing people, putting pressure on the establishment is the way we bring about change, okay? So here in Vermont and in a lot of the United States, we have this concept that we call eugenics, where basically people who are deemed unfit to reproduce are sterilized against their will and their children are taken away from them to make sure that they don't infect the next generation with some bad characteristic, like maybe a disability. Um, and we still practice it here in Vermont, but we talk about it like it's a thing of the past. And so um, we're working with great people in Montpelier who say they want to end this practice, and I hope we can. But I'm curious, um, for the, the gentleman from Finland, if you could tell me if there is a concept of eugenics in Finland. And then for Senator Sanders, I'd like to ask if you think that there's a way that we could go a little bit higher and even try to end eugenics on a federal level, maybe with federal legislation. Well, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I think uh, the word has a very bad echo in it, so uh, I don't think we have that kind of practice. Uh, Maria, have you ever heard? No. Okay. Okay. And, you know, I, I think I understand where you're coming from, but I think as a general practice in this country, uh, it is not the practice of the United States or the state of Vermont to say to people who have disabilities uh, that they can't have kids. That's not my understanding. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I have a question. Actually, I have two questions. First question is, in this country, in the United States, some parties, some people make uh, some decisions for like a women's body so what's the law or rules in Finland? And second question is, if someone like uh, uh, a president or you know, kind of top um, make some, some criminals, what's the consequences? Because here in this country, uh, our ex-president like, uh, had some um, criminal, but nothing happened, and we are shocked actually. So I'm wondering that you, as a Finnish person, how you basically uh, approach to these problems. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, if I got it correctly, the first question concerns the abortion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, firstly, the abortion, it's uh, legal according to certain uh, medical uh, limits. And uh, it's been so, I think, since the 70s early 70s, and um, there is no discussion in Finland. There is no strong opposition to that? No, no. It's, uh, obviously, you have all the different possible views represented in our society, but as I said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a government law, it's a law of the land, and um, 
I don't, I haven't heard of any major discussion uh, on that topic for many, many years. So I think it's the majority of the society considers that that is settled. Uh, then uh, I think the, the criminality, criminality and, and, and politics. Uh, mm, obviously, I'm not taking any stance towards what the U.S. was happening here and so on. I'm, I'm not commenting that side. In our case, um, the criminal law and the sort of uh, system of prisons and all that stuff, I think for us the, the key principle here is that, yes, uh, criminals get a punishment and, and nobody is above the law. Uh, I think the overall system is tries to strike a balance between punishing the criminal and rehabilitating them back to the society. Because the problem is that uh, many of these people uh, that have committed crimes, uh, they can be brought back to the society and become again uh, contributing members of society. And our philosophy says that uh, once you have uh, done your sentence, then you are you have done your, your sort of duty, uh, then you should be able to go back to the society and, 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 and live, live uh, your life normally. So we are putting a lot of resources also on, on how to actually train those prisoners, how to make sure that when they go back to the society, that then they, are, they have more tools to actually uh, succeed and, and get along in, in, that, in that, that life. Uh, of, of course, if you don't do that, there is a high risk that these people will uh, commit new crimes and they'll, they'll come back. We do not succeed all the time. Of course, you have um, people who are, you can't really get rid of those crimes, but, uh, but I think we, that's the intention of the system, and quite often it, it succeeds. You know, uh, on that, uh, you know, Finland is different than Sweden, although they have a lot of commonalities. A number of years ago, uh, I was at a conference uh, in Sweden, Stockholm, uh, and I wanted to visit their jails. I wanted to see what their jails look like, because my wife says just her husband wants to go to a jail. The other people have gone fancy places, and I'm going to a jail. <laughs> but, uh, we went to a maximum security prison, okay? And what blew me away was, you know, in, in the United States, when you're in jail, uh, maximum security, uh, they serve you cafeteria, people come down, they eat. They, it, what they were doing in Sweden is they give workers a certain amount of money, workers, they give uh, inmates a certain amount of money to buy the food themselves. They sell it in the jail. They choose what they want and they cook it up themselves. So we walked into the jail, we're looking around, and there are all these knives that people kitchen knives, sharp knives in a maximum security prison we thought was a little bit strange. <laughs> but the thrust of what the ambassador was saying and what they do there is their philosophy is very different. In this country, admit it or not, although Vermont, by the way, I can tell you proudly does better than most states, but in many states, it's really a punishment thing. You committed a crime, we're going to get even with you. We're going to make your life miserable for as long as we can. And you break people, you talk, I mean, you, you put them in solitary, you keep them in jail for long periods of time. And then when they got out of jail, surprise, surprise, they are embittered. They don't have the skills they need. They don't have the education they need. They don't have the mental health they need. And then they come back at great expense to you, 50,000 bucks a shot to keep somebody in jail. So their philosophy is, okay, somebody committed a crime, how do we reintegrate them into society? How do you give them the education they need, the job training they need? Do they succeed all the time? No. But their rate of recidivism is a lot less than ours is. But that's, that's the distinction, I think, that exists. And by the way, how long have you abolished capital punishment? For how many? I think it's, uh, we had it during the wartime, during the Second World War. But before that, that was, uh, I think it was in the 19th century. So it's been uh, more than 100 years. Uh, I think you already answered one question I had. I have two uh, climate questions. Yeah. One is, is you have nuclear power plants, and as I understand it, they're on seismically stable areas, so you don't have the Fukushima problem. 
And the other question I had is, is you're doing great stuff to reduce your carbon emissions, but what is, what is happening to your snowpack and your glaciation? Well, basically, uh, we don't have glaciers, uh, so it's, uh, uh, we, we have stable snow up there in the north, but it melts down. You may have some summers, you may have some snow which stays on the mountain tops, but uh, we don't have glaciers, so we don't uh, directly uh, know, uh, we, don't, we don't have that issue. Okay. Thank you for coming. Um, so my question is around, Vermont has the highest past month uh, drug use in the country, um, and we also had the highest overdose death rate in the country. And that's in contrast to our um, approach to COVID, in which we did very well, and we had a very low uh, COVID death rate. And so um, when we look at our response to infectious disease, we're pretty good at um, prevention. But when we look at um, drug misuse, which is a big problem, we are just beginning to spend more money on treatment. But as they say in Iceland, treatment is the least effective, most expensive way to deal with the drug um, you know, misuse epidemic in a society. And so my question is around sort of how do you control the um, corporate determinants of health, which are really ill health, which are really encouraging addiction, and which are fighting our efforts to implement science-based prevention methods which have been proven to be effective in places like Iceland. So we worked hard on trying to get that all over the state in Vermont, and we succeeded in getting it in just six cities um, out of 250. So um, how do we get more prevention in, in, in a, a disease that's clearly killing our, our, our people? It is and, uh, uh, horrible. I, I, last week I, was, I went down to the southern part of the state uh, I was in Rutland and Bennington and a few other towns. And what I kept hearing was an increase in uh, drug violence, drug-related violence. Down in Bennington, they used to have nobody firing a gun. Uh, and this year, I think he said there were 18 instances of, of gunshots fired. Uh, I don't have to tell you that in Burlington, we're having a serious problem. Uh, Rutland is having, has had its, its, its problems. Uh, before I give you my thoughts, which are not profound on the issue, maybe, uh, Mr. Ambassador, or maybe you want to talk about, you have a problem as well. How, how do you address it? Well, of course, we try to, uh, firstly, try to educate people that they know the risks, and they try to avoid it. That's why how we use our school system for how all our uh, public uh, sort of uh, education system is, is geared towards that. Uh, drug use is illegal uh, in Finland, so we have no, no legalization of any, any part of the, the drug use. Uh, so it's always a, a crime. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, I think we, st we have a discussion on this, uh, which has gone on for a couple of decades. That's, should we treat cannabis differently? Should it be legalized or not? So far, I think the, the majority has basically uh, concluded that it's uh, it would be a bad solution. It would uh, increase the drug use. Uh, personally, I don't know what's the right answer, but uh, this is the answer we have, uh, we have so far. Uh, I think the, the problem here is that uh, uh, with the synthetic drugs that are cheap and that are easy to uh, distribute, I, I think that for the police, for the law enforcement, for the social security, social security services, I think this is a, it's a really difficult task to tackle. I, I don't think any industrial nation has been able to really fully cope with that crisis because the price distribution effect and also the, the level of uh, overdose uh, deaths uh, with these drugs are is, is so high. So I, I think it's a really big danger for the society. I, I don't have, I mean, nobody has. If I would have and as for how to deal with that, I think everybody would be coming to Helsinki and trying to learn from us. Uh. Well, let me just say, I, I don't know that anyone has any magical answers. I was just thinking, uh, last month I met with the ambassador from Colombia. I don't know if you've met the, the gentleman. Uh, it's a new government there. It's a progressive government. 
Do you know how many households in Colombia are dependent on the production of cocoa? Cocoa or whatever it's called, which becomes cocaine. 300,000 families produce that drug. That's how they live. That's how they make their living. So what they're trying to do, which is again not easy, and Colombia is just one country, is to move those people into agriculture, which is, which is not cocoa related. All right? Not easy. We've got to help them do that. So you've got to get to the source of the problem. Uh, second of all, uh, as uh, the ambassador mentioned, you know, when I was a kid growing up, the drug, there was a drug problem, but nowhere near what it is today. Everybody knew that heroin killed you. Everybody knew that. And I am not sure that young people fully understand that right now. Now, I happen to believe that marijuana should, for a variety of reasons, should be legalized. And I think the president made a, a good step forward by taking right now, you have schedule one of the, uh, whatever it's called, Substance Abuse Act or whatever it is, where marijuana is linked at the same level as heroin and fentanyl. Well, you may, well, not like marijuana, but it is not fentanyl and it surely is not heroin. So I think taking it to another level uh, is, is quite right. So I think prevention in the sense of educating our people is one thing. And number two, it's trying to understand what does it mean that in a country, it is not just drugs, it is alcohol, it is tobacco, it is food. We have a lot of addiction in this country. And it speaks to, I think, a deterioration of community. People need that stuff to get by. If your life is falling apart, you know what? You know, maybe heroin is, is an answer. It's a killer answer, we know. I mean, it's not an answer, but what I mean is I can, you can understand why somebody turns to a high if their life is that, in, in that much despair. So we've got to deal with that. Why is there so much despair uh, in the country? So it is a very, you know, and then you've got cartels who are almost major billion dollar military operations, all right, who are fighting governments throughout Latin America and, and Mexico. It is a bitch of a problem. And, uh, but I think, you know, clearly Vermont does better, by the way, than most states in terms of prevention. I mean, I think we do well, but it's better, I think, than many states. No, you don't think so? I know. It, yeah. yeah. Well, there, there are reasons why, but I mean, I think there are states where there's almost no, no uh, treatment capabilities. I, I would say in terms of treatment, uh, we try to do a little bit better. But treatment, it's hard. Addiction is a very hard thing to overcome. It is an expensive thing. Should we invest in it? Absolutely. And by the way, I mean, one of the things uh, in the so-called uh, gun safety bill that passed a couple of months ago, frankly, it didn't have all that much to do with guns, but it put $8 billion into mental health. And some of that stuff will be related uh, to uh, addiction. Um, this question is for the ambassador. And as the senator has already alluded, in this country, um, we have a really big health care crisis. And in my opinion, one of the biggest cracks is mental health services. So if you can comment on how um, broadly your mental health system is structured, and do your citizens have the right type of mental health access at the right time um, for your citizens across the country? Thanks. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and I, I would say that uh, we are coping with an increasing, increasing problem. Uh, it's been getting worse since the pandemic. I think we know the reasons people, uh, they have had some economic hardship. Uh, the, the isolation for many people doesn't work. So uh, I think we are, families are, many families are kind of uh, are living in a more difficult situation. So there's a kind of uptick in those cases. Uh, especially it's, it concerns the, the younger people. So uh, our system uh, of health care, it's, I mean, the mental health care, it, it's basically, it, it's part of the same system that functions in, in every other disease or, or illnesses as well. Uh, but they have a lot of uh, workflow. And I think that there is a, there is a problem of, 
of getting uh, an access to, to uh, sort of suitable care immediately. Of course, if there's a really difficult case that a person needs an instant care that is being taken care of. But if you need an appointment, if you, if you need kind of a, if your case is a bit more mild, then I think uh, there are long queues to get that treatment. So there is a problem. Uh, another problem of ours, so that this discussion is also a bit balanced in the sense that we have troubles as well. Our main problem is that we have a lack of qualified personnel. Why? Because we have an aging problem in the society. So uh, we have demographically less payers of the system. The system, in my view, is good. But if you, if you have a disbalance between who are actively in work life and who are financing the system versus who are on pension, mainly using the services. So uh, I think we have now a disbalance here. And, and the difficulty is that because you have more older people and, and uh, they need more services, and so the same old number of nurses, for example, is not sufficient to cover this increased workload. And, and this is a problem that we can't solve easily, because you just can't train a qualified nurse out of <coughs> just anybody. You have to go through the school, so you have to get the, get the qualification. So that's a difficult problem. It's going to take years uh, to, to solve it uh, in our case. And there are no quick fixes either. Okay, maybe a couple more questions. Heather, yeah. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your time fielding so many questions. Um, I'd like to talk about the future. I just finished 10 years on a local school board, and about eight years ago, I read a book called The Smartest Kids in the World. The, uh, it was by a New York Times reporter who highlighted, among other things, the Finnish educational system, and it was really striking. Um, but one person in, on one school board, board in the smallest state in the country, or second smallest state by population in the country, it's hard to, how do you start fomenting change? So my question for the ambassador is, what elements of the Finnish system might we consider implementing here in order to achieve some of the success that the Finnish people have. Well, thank you. Um, obviously, I'm not going to give you any, any advice uh, how you should run your country. But uh, I think in our case, the, the, the key reason for a success in education system is, is fairly simple. First of all, your teachers have to have high qualifications. In our case, you need to have masters. You need to have masters. Secondly, um, a teacher profession, you have to have a decent salary. In our case, it doesn't mean that they, they get rich or they are kind of get super high income. But in most places, I, I think that the tough part is Helsinki, which is the housing costs are high. But elsewhere, teaching is a, is a good way to a middle class, stable life, and fulfilling professional life. And, uh, and, and actually, the, the salary is competitive uh, in, in, in all, all, all Finland, except for Helsinki, I would say. Thirdly, I think teachers, when they have masters, they earn a decent income. What do they need? They need sufficient degree of independence. So we are not micromanaging what the teachers and how the teachers should teach. They get broad objectives, what the, 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 the students need to learn. Then they are free to choose their own ways of dealing with that. So we don't think that teachers are just like robots that repeat some, some sort of a plan given from above. But they, they are highly trained professionals that need a, a degree of uh, liberty to do that. That's how you actually also attract top talent. So in our case, in those faculties that train teachers, actually getting into those faculties is, is, is really competitive. So it's not just a kind of a leftover faculty for those who don't get into other faculties. So it's actually best and brightest. Many of them actually not, don't only go to medical school or things like that, but many choose that profession. So I think the, for us, the keeping the, the, the respect and, and decent pay level 
and independence uh, of a teacher profession is, is one of the key, key factors. But then I would add uh, also this broader societal uh, things. Like in our case, our social programs actually started really in earnest after the Second World War. How? Free school meal. Why? It, it was a really practical thing because Finland was such a poor country that uh, many people simply couldn't afford almost any food at all uh, during the school day. So the government had to kind of fill the gap so that these kids would grow healthy. Because if you don't have any protein and so, so your, your school results drop, uh, your, you will have all kinds of trouble. So it was actually cheaper to provide them with that meal rather than deal with the consequences later on. So, uh, uh, so yeah, but I think you have also these more broad dimensions rather than just teaching. Good. What's, what is interesting about the Finnish system also is, is I understand that your kids go to school later, they have shorter school days, and they have less homework. In other words, what they try to do there also is create a relaxed environment where kids can retain their spontaneity and enjoy things. And when you have that kind of condition, then you're open to learning. If you drill kids, if you depress kids, kids don't want to go to school, you're like forcing them to learn. But learning should be fun. And I think that's something uh, that Finland approaches in a fairly unique way. Is my right? Yeah, yeah you, you, you're right. Uh, so in our case, you go to school, you go to preschool when you are six, and that's actually obligatory now. Uh, you have to go to preschool. Uh, then you start your real school first grade when you are seven. Uh, yeah, the school days, because my boys go to this uh, British school in, in DC, so I know that the days are longer than they would be in Finland. And um, it would be more relaxed in Finland, especially the first years. So uh, you are right. Uh, we try to kind of create an environment when they are not, uh, they shouldn't be so tired. Uh, we shouldn't put too much emphasis on the academic heavy stuff in, in, the, in, in the early, early, early years. So um, that's the philosophy. I think, I mean, I'm a product of that philosophy. I don't know if, if that's good, but uh, I think uh, we can compare that. And, and I, I tend to believe that, uh, like for example, in our case, we know that our boys, they, 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 they speak English at school. They speak only Finnish at home. Uh, so they have an extra burden. They have to operate on two different languages all the time. They used to have a third language as well. But now they've, they've basically lost. But what it does it mean? It does mean that uh, we don't really burden them with a lot of after-school academic activities or anything. Because I mean, we appreciate that you guys had to learn. You go to school in English. My older boy he reads books in English. It's not his native language at all. So it's it's already enough. So we are not trying to get overly ambitious or try to make Einstein's out of them uh, much too early. OK, maybe the last question. Heli? You got somebody? Where? OK, uh, good. Yes, um, Mr. Ambassador, uh, before coming to Vermont, I spent two years in Vilnius, um, Lithuania, where everyone I met held Finnish people in the highest esteem. Um, they were the most popular people at every party. <laughs> and and um, I was wondering how the Finnish people feel about their neighbors, both in the Baltic states and now especially with their new government in Sweden. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously, um, we are friendly people. We love peace. We think uh, we should always get along with your neighbors, even if you have different uh, systems of beliefs and, and political systems. I'd, obviously, Sweden is our closest neighbor. We used to live in one country. We used to be part of Sweden. Uh, as Finland was always distinctive in terms of language. We had our cultural and, and also some political uh, distinctiveness. But uh, we were part of the same country, same political system. So we shared the same laws 700 years together. So Sweden is like a there are differences, but Sweden is like a, 
it's like a, another side of the coin, uh, if, if you will. Then, of course, other Nordics, Norway, is, we have 700 kilometers, so 450 miles uh, of common border. Norway is, is the same, although we're never part of the same country uh, at the same time. Estonians, Estonia, uh, one of the Baltic countries. Uh, actually, the Finnish and Estonian languages are the, together with Hungarian, are the only Finno-Ugric languages in Europe that are being spoken. Uh, so uh, we can actually learn Estonian fairly quickly, and they can also learn Finnish. The problem with that is that you may have an illusion that you understand Estonian because it's so close. And many, many of the, I would say, critical words have a totally opposite meaning. So, 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 so Finnish people who think they know Estonian are taking huge risks in Tallinn. <laughs> So uh, Russians, uh, obviously that's a complicated history. I think we've had our fair share of wars. The last war ended um, um, in 1944. Uh, and was it a tough war? Yes. Uh, just to give an example, winter war with Finland and Soviet Union uh, was in 1939 uh, until uh, March uh, 1940. Uh, US lost in Vietnam in the peak months of fighting. It was, it was May 1968. You lost 500 men a week. In the Winter War, Finland lost 800 guys a day during the first fight. And that was out of 4 million. So that tells you how intense the war was. So um, if you've gone through all these kind of things, then of obviously there is a historical burden. I think one of the consequences of this Russian aggression towards uh, Ukraine was that actually it opened some of these old wounds in the Finnish side of our psychology. It's not us this time, it's Ukrainians, but, uh, but you can't really forget those things. Both of my grandfathers, they did fight many years against the Soviets on the front lines. So I'm, I'm part of that generation who still grew up listening to their stories and that, that. But nevertheless, we've been trying to really develop our relations with the Russians since the break, breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, to give you an example, before the pandemic 2019, Finland did issue 800,000 visas to Russians. And 10% of all Russian foreign travel was to Finland. So we, it was, we were actually, there's a lot of interaction. Now our people think differently. We think that if you guys start attacking neighboring countries, if you commit war crimes like you do, if you want, just want to kill people, you destroy civilians, you destroy infrastructure, then we don't actually want to see you here. So we actually limited now the, the issuing of visas dramatically, basically down to bare, almost zero. So we are living difficult times now. We also lost all of our trade which was roughly 5% of our foreign trade. So that's a complicated relationship. Uh, I don't know what the long-term consequences of this conflict are for our relations, but they will be different. Uh, they will be different uh, for years and years to come, unfortunately. All right. Um, well, I hope you found the evening uh, enjoyable and informative. Uh, thank you all very, very much for coming. And let me thank the ambassador. And and we have to do that. Thank you.